But let us pray, and we'll start into our message. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege to live in a country that is free, where we can open up your word and to study and to hear your voice to us through your holy scriptures today. We pray, O oh Lord, that all would be set aside except for you and your word, and that your truth would come to a resonate to our hearts, and that, Lord, we would be more motivated by your great love for us, by your truth, to live and to walk with you in these times. We ask your blessing in this end, to this end, in Jesus' name, amen. So I would like to encourage everyone as, as a Christian, as a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, to study your Bible and to continue in your personal Bible study. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the people that fascinate, fascinate me somewhat from the past is the Bible translator William Tyndale. You may have heard of William Tyndale. William Tyndale was uh, quoted as saying, if God spare my life ere many years, I will cause the boy that drives the plow to know more of the scriptures than you. And he was talking to a clergyman. So this was his, his hope and goal. And um, so William Tyndale was blessed uh, by the age of 21. He was a master of eight languages. And he decided to um, give his talent to the Lord, to serve the Lord. And in his day, around the 1500s, 1520s, whatever, the Bible was not prevalent at all, and it was not available at all or very well in English. And um, so Tyndale uh, requested in 1523 to an official authorization to the bishop to translate the New Testament from Greek, but it was considered a, a risk in, in England because of the Reformation that had taken place in Germany. They were fearful that this would take place in England, so he was denied. Nevertheless, to make a long story short, through many ups and downs, Tyndale began to translate the Bible into English. And um, in the end, um, William Tyndale was, um, he translated all the New Testament and much of the Old Testament, but he, he was um, one, a per, that, that at some point in time, they captured him, he was captured, and um, his translation obviously was stopped at that point. But he did translate the first 14 books of the Old Testament as well as, well as the New Testament. And uh, <clears throat> a lot of the translations that he did are still prevalent to this day. In fact, um, much of the, it's, it, is, it is, you know, you could, it's estimated that when the King James Version was finally translated, and it was translated starting out with 50 of the best scholars in the world at that time, 50 were commissioned, they realized that much of the work that Tyndale had completed already needed little improvement. In fact, some estimates say that roughly 84% of the New Testament and 76% of the Old Testament in the King James Version is the work of or strongly influenced by Tyndale and his translation. At any point, anyway, the um, point being is that he was able to do that by God's grace. And if you own an ver English ver version of the Bible, any, even any English version, many of uh, the phrases there are attributed when, to William Tyndale. In fact, things like that we use today, the powers that be, eat, drink, and be merry, the salt of the earth, the sign of the times, it shall come to pass, fight the good faith. All these and many more are exact trans or translations or phrases by William Tyndale. In fact, at the time when he translated, the English language was not a, an appreciated language. In fact, it was not considered a proper language for high society to even be speaking. But he also did work where there was work where words did not exist in his translation, he invented them. You may have heard the word scapegoat, atonement, Passover, peacemaker. Those words didn't exist until Tyndale was doing his translation of the Bible. So anyway, Tyndale was not only the father of the modern, did some of the early translations, 
but he is also known as the father of the modern English language. But William Tyndale was a martyr, but he was captured, and he spent 500 days in a dark castle near Belgium in darkness and cold for 500 days. And he requested, historically, he's requested for some warmer clothing, and he requested a candle. And he spent 500 days there waiting for his execution. And he was eventually executed and burned at the stake. But anyway, the point being of all that is some men sacrificed great things to be able for us to read the Bible free, free gratis. With that said, let us turn to Matthew chapter 24, verse 1. We're going to look at a lot of text today from Matthew chapter 24. And we'll start with verse 1 in Matthew chapter 24. We'll all turn there. So it says, And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him to show him the buildings of the temple. So the disciples wanted to show Jesus the temple. And in Mark 13, 1, they says, Master, see what matter of stones, what buildings are here. So the disciples wanted to, as it were, show Jesus the awesome temple. The temple in Jesus' day had been uh, impressively and magnificently rebuilt. It was the second temple, or, or uh, it had been improved, so to speak, by Herod the Great. And Herod the Great was appointed by the Romans, king of Judea, from 37 to 4 B.C. And he poured enormous amounts of money into the temple, partially to appease the Jews. And it was a beautiful temple. Some of the stones weighed up to 50 tons each. Silver and gold were not spared. Herod hired architects from Greece, Rome, and Egypt to design it, but the actual construction was done by the priests because it was considered holy, and the priests did a lot of, or maybe most of the actual construction, so history tells us. But then Jesus makes a, so the disciples were obviously impressed, and they wanted to show Jesus this awesome building and the temple mount. But Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. So when the disciples, disciples heard this, they were shocked because this building was awesome. 50 tons, uh, ton stones. And it was very stable. It was beautifully destroyed. Silver and gold. It would have to be the end of the world before a temple like this could ever be destroyed. It even had the backing of the Roman Empire. So this would never happen except at the end of the world. And so Jesus is saying here that one stone will not be left on another. So the temple was there until AD 74, AD 70, and Jesus' prediction and prophecy came true. In fact, um, Josephus even quotes about what happened in A.D. 70 when the Romans destroyed the temple. It says, and this is Josephus, the historian says, Now as soon as the army had no more people to slay or to plunder, basically a million people were destroyed in this, in this, um, in this war, because there remained none to be objects of their fury, Titus Caesar gave orders that they should now de demolish the entire city and the temple. Other than a few towers and forts for the Roman garrison, everything was destroyed. It was so thoroughly laid, even with the ground, by those who dug it up the foundation, that there was nothing left to make those that came thither to believe that Jerusalem had ever been inhabited. The Wars of the Jews, or History of the Destruction of Jerusalem, Book 7, Chapter 1.1, History of Josephus. So... The understanding is that the soldiers were, were melting down or trying to tear the stones apart to get at the silver and the gold. So Jesus is saying and he, um, that the end of the world will happen. But so the prophecy of Matthew 24 is a dual prophecy. It's the prophecy that answered the disciples' questions about the temple, but Jesus also extended that prophecy to extend to the end of time. In verse 3 it says, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him, saying privately, Tell us, when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming and in the end of the world? So Jesus began to give signs of the end of the world and of these prophecies. 
And we're going to look at some of the signs today to see how they line up with the reality of where we are. So in Luke chapter 21, verse 26, we see the first sign we want to talk about is fearful signs and global distress. Luke 21, 26, men's heart failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming up on the earth for the powers of heaven will be shaken. So if we look at the world in its totality today, we see fearful signs and indications of global distress coming upon our world. Despite incredible gains in knowledge, science, and technology, and medical breakthroughs, it is obvious that all is not right with the world. Jesus said there will be fear in people's hearts as they look at the uncertainty of what's happening in the world. Even secular, non-biblical people see serious concerns on a global scale. So what are these issues that we look at that people are afraid and concerned about? Food insecurity in the world. We'll look more at that. Some people are concerned about artificial intelligence takeover, that machines and robots will take us over. Disinformation, natural disasters, floods, fire, drought, famine, hurricanes, tornadoes. We just had it. Let's just think about what happened this week. We had a tornado not just past Rolling Fork tornado in Mississippi. We've had earthquakes, Turkey and Syria. Um, inflated prices of goods and services, fluctuation of fuel prices, economic uncertainty, bank failures, immorality, political unrest, wars, bio weapons, terrorism, hatred, oppression, economic disparity between the rich and the poor, rebellion, anarchy, political strife and corruption, random violence, random violence, nuclear weapons fear, pandemics, diseases, mass shootings. Is there anything maybe we should maybe perhaps be concerned about? That's that sign. So that sign, we can say people are feared, thinking, thinking people are afraid and concerned. Even uh, climate change concerns have people concerned. Wars and rumors of war, Matthew 24, 6. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. So let's look at wars and rumors of wars. According to the Geneva Academy, here's some wars going on. Middle East and North Africa, 45 armed conflicts. Africa, more than 35 armed conflicts. Asia, 21 armed conflicts. Europe, seven armed conflicts going on as we speak. What about rumors of war? Are there any rumors of war? Well, yes, there's war, rumors of war between US, China and Taiwan, the US and China, the US and Iran, Israel and Iran, and Pakistan and India, Russia and the US, and there's probably more. And then I forgot to even mention Ukraine and Russia a full-blown war going on. So are there any wars or rumors of wars? Yes. And then there's the potential use of nuclear weapons that has been discussed. The world is now a global, a global community and wars exist or potential. A war in one country between two countries can impact not just two countries but everyone in the world. So. Wars, there's all these wars all over the world. For example, in Somalia, there are wars and impacts due to the Al Shabaab terrorists in Somalia. People on the run, people, there are refugees fleeing and uh, running from these situations. And there's, these things are going on, these local conflicts all over the world. I just saw you know, there was a uh, documentary, Somalia Story of Survival, on YouTube where fleeing, they were showing the impacts, not only of war, but drought. In this case, it was more about fleeing terrorist groups and people were leaving their locale to go to refugee camps. And um, the uh, people there that were going, they were showing in this video, um, they had left their homes in a caravan and they had walked to this camp outside Dalo in Somalia. They had walked for 10 days with no food and little water. It was an amazing, and if you look at the, I'm tempted to show you the video, it's like five minutes, I don't know if I should or not, but anyway, it was, it was just a devastating scene, 
of almost um, a hellscape that these people were living in in this camp, 30,000 refugees living in this camp, the dust storms going on. I'll keep moving. Pestilences for nations, there shall be pestilences for, and so have there been pestilences? There's been all kinds of pestilences. Just most recently, COVID-19 has impacted the world. 6.8 million people have died from COVID since 2020, early 2020. And the world, scientists are saying, the world is dangerously unprepared for future pandemics and so on. The International Federation of Red Cross and, Rest, and, and Red Crescent Societies warned in a scathing new report, and so on. We know this. Then there's non-communicable diseases. I didn't realize this, but do you realize that NCDs, non-communicable diseases, kill 41 million people every year? Non-communicable diseases are behavioral type diseases. Um, the uh, solution to these type, disease, these type diseases are diseases such as cardiovascular disease, heart disease, strokes, cancer, chronic respiratory diseases and kidney disease caused by diabetes. These are the diseases that kill, actually they kill more, it appears, 41 million people a year, more than wars or even famines. Um, as Adventists, we have some behavioral processes that can help us and we can out of earth fit to the world in fighting some of these diseases. Earthquakes, we know there's a lot of earthquakes. According to United States Geological Survey, um, taking long-term records since about 1900, we can expect about 16 major earthquakes in any given year. That includes 15 earthquakes with a magnitude of seven on the Richter scale and one earthquake of the magnitude of eight on the Richter scale. In the past 40 to 50 years, our records show that we have exceeded the long-term average number of a major earthquakes about a dozen times. So Jesus said that would be a, a feature of the end of time, that there would be earthquakes. And we just saw one in, in Turkey and Syria where 20,000 people were killed, a tragedy of epic proportions. Then there's famines. Again, we talk about famines. Uh, according to the World Food Program, an expected 345 million people are projected to be food insecure in 2023. That's more than double the number of tw in 2020. This con constitutes a staggering rise of 200 million people compared to pre-COVID pandemic levels. Then it goes on, this is 10 times more than five years ago an alarming rapid increase. So some areas are facing uh, great um, uh, famines. The Horn of Africa, Somalia, they've had five failed rainy seasons in a row. We're in their sixth rainy season right now, it's probably gonna fail. So in that country alone, more than one million refugees are fleeing their homes in search of water and food. The UN has already announced that famine is at the door in this country. Up to two million children no longer attend school because of the drought. Half a million children under five years old could die from malnutrition in the coming months. And the crops, the crops, the statistic, one statistic I heard is that Somalia, 20 years ago, 66% of the land had vegetation. Now it's 17%. It's just a dust bowl. And it's unprecedented um, um, disaster due to uh, the famine in that land. So Jesus said this was gonna happen, it's happening on a grand scale, these type of things are happening in the world. And um, yes, and then also like in like Somalia, a lot of herds, they're losing millions of their animals due to they can't take care of them. Then sign number six, Jesus says that the love of many shall wax cold. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax, will wax cold. Matthew 24, 12. For men will be, and it says in 2 Timothy, men will be lovers of themselves, coveters, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, high -minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, Having a, this is the shocking part, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. 
So Jesus is saying these things will exist in our day. Can we not say these characteristics are prevalent in, in our day? Then another sign, here's a quote, here's a quote that, that, that struck me. This is from Testimonies of the Church 9-11. Men possessed of demons are taking the lives of men, women, and little children. Men have be become infatuated with vast, and every spe species of evil prevails. That, disturb, that describes our time. This is striking. You know, it says, the thing that struck me here is little children. It's hard to believe, but we just saw that this week, did we not? I was listening to a, some, some commentary, they, a report from National Public Radio, and they were interviewing the doctors in, in, in Tennessee. You may have heard it yourself. And the doctor said, we got this call that income, we have incoming and we have gunshot wounds. These doctors are like, we've done this before. We know what to do. They got ready. They were ready. They were prepared. They were ready to do the surgeries. They had done this before. They knew how to handle it. And then they found out what happened, and, and the little kids came, and it's like their organs are too small. These are war weapons. There was, they were already dead. It's, and the doctor said, we all went in this room, about 30 of us. <clears throat> and they said, they just went in a room and sat there in silence, and some people were crying. And there was nothing they could do, so they went on. You know, soon business got back to usual, but the shock of these things happening in our world are just uh, devastating. And uh, this is the world we live in. Then there's a conflict between labor and capital. That's in James chapter 5, verse 4. Behold, the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which of you kept back by fraud crieth. And the cries of them which and reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabbath. So the gulf between the rich and the poor continues to widen. In many places in the world, the poor are exploited for cheap labor that brings huge profits to their masters. According to the Bloomberg Billionaires Index, 131 billionaires more than doubled their net, during the pand their net worth during the pandemic. Elon Musk, this is, I think, written in 2021, so this is a little bit dated. Elon Musk, the planet's second wealthiest man at that time, boasted a $139 billion fortune but he had less than 50 billion before the pandemic. And a lot of other uh, people multiplied their money. But at the same time, close to 97 million people on earth, more than the population of any European nation, were per pushed into extreme poverty in 2020, earning less than $1.90 a day, the World Bank defined poverty line. So there's huge disparities between the just they say exorbitant rich. The Bible does not, let me say this, the Bible does not condemn wealth, but it does condemn those who hoard. It does, cannot, it does not condemn those who through hard work, investment, and thrift attain more wealth. We're not saying that. The Bible does not endorse a system where everyone should be equal. But the Bible does state that those who do not recompense people for, who work for them in a fair manner, that is what the Bible condemns. The Bible does not, the Bible endorses private property. There are some say you shouldn't have private property. The Bible does not endorse that. Isaiah 65, they shall build houses and inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. They shall build and not another inhabit. The point being here, it, the Bible condemns hoarding, greed, selfishness that does not afford fair payment for labor and services rendered. That's what's being talked about in James, that people are using people for cheap labor, that it can't make a living labor while they, they profit exorbitantly from this, this. The Bible condemns that. 1 Timothy 6.17 says this, Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate. People like Abraham, Job, and Nicodemus use their money appropriately. Just want to state that. Spiritual deception. Jesus says in the last days that there will be spiritual deception. Verse 20, 24, verse 4, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and deceive many. 
1 John 4, 1, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. So there are many seducing spirits. Verse 10, 1 Timothy 4, 1, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times shall, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So there are many deceptions in the last days. So let's look at one of the deceptions that Satan has in the last days very quickly. And that is the manner of Christ's second return. This is a, a manner. So Jesus says in Revelation 1, 7, Behold, he cometh with the clouds, and every eye shall see him, even those which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. So we see here that every eye shall see him. So let's look at the characteristic here also in Matthew 24, 27. For as lightning comes out of the east and shineth even to the west, so also shall the coming of man, son of man, be. Lightning is very visible. Then in verse 30 of Matthew 24, and then shall appear the sign of, the sign of man in heaven. Then shall the trial of the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the son of man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So this, this, this um, contradicts the saying that the wicked will not see Christ coming or that it will be secret. It says here, all the tribes shall mourn because they're not ready. Then, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Then in verse 31, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory, all the holy angels with him. And then in verse 31, again, and he shall, did I miss something? In 24, I'm sorry, Matthew 24, 31. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather as elect from, elect from the four winds from one end to the other. So there shall be a trumpet. So the coming of Christ will be visible. And Acts shows this visibility in Acts chapter 1 verse 11. This same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as you've seen him go up into heaven. So as he was taken up, they saw it. As he comes back, he will, they will say it, see it. Christ's coming is also audible, right? 1 Timothy 4, 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise. So there's three audibles here. One, the Lord descends with a shout. Two, the Lord descends with the voice of the archangel. Three, the Lord descends with the sound of a trumpet. Does this sound secret? It doesn't sound secret. 2 Peter 3.10 but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with far fervent heat. Again, very visible and very um, obvious to see. So, the flood of Noah, it says, you know, is, is supposed to, is, is a pattern or copy of what it would be like, and it was not secret, the flood of Noah. So this, this, the coming of Christ will not be secret. It is not a secret rapture. Loud, visible, can be seen. And if you look at 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, it verifies this. Um, and you can look in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We can turn there really fast, 1 Corinthians 15. Okay, verse 51, maybe this doesn't do the audible part, but it says, Behold, I show you, Mr., we should not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, the twinkling of an eye, at the sound of the last trump. So there is noise there. Sound of the last trump, for the dead in Christ shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed, and so on. So that's just some of the deceptions. So Satan has these deceptions. I, was, I know someone that gave me a piece of literature the other day, and their, their, their take is that, well, Jesus came in 1914, and he was here, and, and uh, the Perusa came, but, it, and, but it, no one ever knew about it. That's not what the Bible says. It's not what the Bible says. So it will not be secret. So the next sign is that the world will be like it was in the days of Noah. And in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, 
and six, uh, and 11, it says like this, and God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imaginable thought of the hearts was only evil continually. The earth was corrupt also before God and the earth was filled with violence. So what were some of the characteristics in the days of Noah? Wickedness. Every imagination of the heart evil continually. Corrupt and violent. We are approaching those times e even now. And so these are some of the signs that Jesus gave. I won't, Jesus gave. I won't even go to any more. But Jesus did say something else that people are sometimes deceived about. Jesus said, pray, pray that your flight will not be in the winter or the Sabbath day. And he's speaking now to the people in A.D. 70. So if the Sabbath was done away with, why would Jesus say, don't pray that your flight don't be on the Sabbath? So that's another thing that God has done away with the law. He has no law. But there's but that, a moral law, but he does. So let's move on. Michael, if you have the uh, slides ready. So we know the signs. I mean, even people who are not biblically religious know that there's something going on in the world. If you can walk to anybody in the street and say, do you think we live in the last days? And most, even non-religious people say, yeah, I do, just based on what's going on. So let's uh, look at, let's see if I can get this to work, at some of the things we can do to prepare for Jesus coming. So let's look at, before we do that, back to Matthew chapter 24 really quick. And let's look at what Jesus tells us. Verse 42, watch therefore, for you know what I know not what hour the Lord, your Lord does come. But know this, that if the good men of the house had known in what watch the thief would have come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore, be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man cometh. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord has made ruler over his household, to give him meat in due season? Blessed is that servant in whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you, that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. So God is telling us, in lieu of these signs, what manner of persons ought we to be, and what should we be, we should be ready and prepared for Jesus coming as Christians. And we should be like the five wise virgins, having the Holy Spirit and being ready. So let's look at some ways we can be ready. Number one, prayer. I like this quote, prayer and effort, effort and prayer. You must pray as though the efficiency and praise were all due to God, which it is, and labor as though the duty were all your own. Now, here comes, can I do this? Nope, went the wrong way, that way. Okay. Let's see, which way I go, Michael? Um, okay, I want to go to the next one. Okay, there we go. We should always, as Christians, be studying the Word of God, and we should be we we should study and strive to conform our lives to the precepts of the Bible. Christians should be preparing for what is soon to break upon the world as an overwhelming surprise, and this preparation they should make by diligently studying the word of God and striving to conform their lives to his precepts. The Bible is for everyone. It's for you. It's for me. It's not for just clergy. And by conforming our lives to his precepts, we will be ready for Jesus to come. Okay, next slide. I, I'll tell you what, Michael, I'm going to let you do it because I'm killing it, okay? All right. Know and understand, we should know the three angels' messages this last call that God is giving to the world, fear God, give glory to him, worship the creator, for the hour of his judgment has come. This is something we should be looking at. Next slide. By God's grace, if we know we have known sin in our life, if we have known sin in our life, God, we can't just pass over this and say, you know, I heard someone say the other day, what was it? Well, I don't want to nitpick the Bible, you know, I don't want to nitpick. That part about whatever it is we don't like. I don't. If we have known sin, sin is transgression of the law, we should forsake, ask God to help us to forsake it. Confess it and forsake it. God will ask us to do that and he will give us peace. But we're like, if we're like David, we play a game that we can sort of keep this sin and God's going to let us bring it. We, we, that won't work. Next slide. We should not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. I credit every person to come out to worship here today. You know, the church, the last time I checked, is still not perfect. 
I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. But God wants us to come and worship together. And he wants us to encourage and to uh, serve one another. And it says to exhort one another so much the more as you see the day approaching. Do we not see the day approaching? Amen. Amen. Okay, next slide. You know, there's other spiritual resources. There's some good spiritual resources out there. You have to be very wise in where you go with them. Some of them, some of them are not good. Attacking no one particularly. All it does is attack the church. That's their job full time. Attacking the Seventh-day Adventist church and its leaders. And it, if it finds out any bad thing, it puts it up on them on, so other people can look at it and say, oh, yeah, so Seventh-day Adventists, they're like this. Is that doing God's work? No. So watch out for that. But... On the other hand, there's, there's other great programs that can help you in your spiritual growth. And I wrote a couple of them down here. Hope Through Prophecy is a great a resource for prophecy and for sharing. And what they do is when they give out the message and so on, they, people can call in and they will set them up and say, hey, here's a church in your neighborhood. You can go and learn more and worship. They are working. They are, they are um, working with the church. Bible Flock Box is a good one, of course. Amazing Facts, Amazing Discoveries, Hope Channel, 3ABN, ADT, TV Watch, and so on. But use the uh, spiritual test when you go somewhere. There's some deception out there. But it's okay to, to, to study and to broaden your spiritual scale. You know, it's not just right here. It's, there's other places that can encourage you in your Christian walk. You know, you're, you're going to listen to something, right? You're going to watch something. So watch something that's going to be to your spiritual benefit. Because there's a lot out there that is not. Next slide. Share with others, you know. Share with others. I know we have some great people who share. Share books. Share uh, invitations to church. Invitations to eat to live. You know, the plant giveaway was a sharing exercise. We should share what we have with others. That's what God has asked us to do. Next slide. And read the spirit of prophecy. The spirit of prophecy has some special blessing for us. Now, when I first came to church, I was like, I don't know what this is. Well, here's my, my advice. Read it for yourself and decide prayerfully. And to me, it's, a, it's an extreme blessing. It all, the spirit of prophecy always points to Jesus Christ. It always uplifts Jesus. And it always encourages people to continue their walk with God. Next, next. Health message. We have health principles. If you haven't embraced them, if you're standing back on those, Begin to embrace them, therefore your benefit. We're not here to be hard on people and to preachy and to make someone feel bad. The health principles are for your good. That's the, they should be presented in terms of encouragement, to encourage us to, to, to and then they're nothing, uh, there's no big secret there. You know, you know, get some fresh air, drink a lot of water, don't eat processed foods, uh, get exercise, plant-based. That kind of thing. And we're all on the ladder on the different part there. We are just encouraged there. But if you want to be healthy, you want to take care of yourself, nothing wrong with that. Next slide. Contemplate God's promises. You know, God has some great promises for you. You know, this world is not our final destination. And I like the te a text, I have not seen, nor ear heard, nor entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. Contemplate what God has for you. Jeremiah 29, 11. I have a plan for you. I have a purpose for you. And uh, God has great plans for us. And you learn, the more you learn about God, the more you love God. And, and the more you behold what you behold, that's what you become like. So if you're looking at bad things, you're going to become like bad things. But if you're looking at Christ, you're going to become more like him. Next slide. And I'll close on this one. I thought this was an awesome quote. It was in our Sabbath school um, lesson today. It was in our um, companion uh, notes. But this quote here was sort of amazed me, this quote. It says, those in the strength of Christ who overcome the great enemy of God and man will occupy a position in the heavenly courts above angels who have never fallen. Is that not profound? That is profound. And so God has great plans for you and me. Eyes have never seen, but the enemy of God and man wants to blind us. He holds up tinsel. He holds up little, thing, little trinkets over here, a little fun here, a little fun there. And I was 
listened to an interview of some gentleman who had sort of departed from the faith. One one went to Hollywood. And in fact, they both went to Hollywood to do things and be big, have a big life. You know, and they said that they would see these people and they thought this was the, the big time. And he saw that, you know what, they're, they're, Hollywood actually stinks. It's like polluted, number one. And then a lot of people there that supposedly are supposed to be happy. He said he met one guy, that he was all happy, he was doing great. And the next day he hanged himself. Real, I don't understand. He, and he realized the faith that he'd been given was real and that the things that Satan holds out as supposedly the good life isn't quite so good as is is made up to be. So in closing, Jesus is coming soon. He's preparing a people to meet him, and that people are you and I. Let us stay on the course. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Thank you for watching our videos. If you like it, click here to watch another. Remember to subscribe and to share it with others so they can hear the gospel as well. God bless you.